Topics for this talk is cardiac microelectric mechanical systems, specifically one that can be placed in the pulmonary artery. Um, these uh, devices have been designed to help with the treatment of heart failure patients. Heart failure is becoming uh, an ever-increasing problem in the world and the United States while we are dropping the rates of cardiovascular death from things like coronary artery disease at the same time the uh, incidence and prevalence of congestive heart failure is going up. Uh, it seems like we're saving people from their myocardial infarctions but we're creating more patients with congestive heart failure. Uh, there's a lot of economic uh, pressure to improve the treatment of congestive heart failure uh, with millions of people affected by this uh, syndrome. Uh, we're having increasing expenditures. Congestive heart failure is the most common ERG for patients hospitalized in the United States. So part of the strategy and treatment of heart failure management is to slow down the progression of disease. And there's been a lot of strides made in this effort over the past especially 30 years. Uh, previously, the prognosis for someone diagnosed with congestive heart failure was, you know, 50% mortality in a couple of years. Well, that's changed dramatically with the drug we have available now, but one of the things we see is we still have patients that are decompensating uh, and being hospitalized, and it appears that that worsens your prognosis because every time you're hospitalized with congestive heart failure, your mortality is impacted by the fact that you decompensated and required another hospitalization. And you can see the, the kind of uh, mortality rates of people who have not had a hospitalization, have not had an escalation in their therapy compared to those patients who uh, have required those things. So our current tools are fairly uh, ineffective in reducing the burden of heart failure on hospitalizations. Um, if you look at all the patients who are hospitalized for congestive heart failure, and they go through their hospitalization, and actually about 40% of people are discharged just as much in congestion as they were when they were admitted. There's a lot of patients that actually get admitted to the hospital for heart failure. They don't lose any weight, and they go back home same weight, same amount of congestion, they just feel better, maybe because they got oxygen and they uh, got some, some other therapies. 60% of the people who do have a change in their fluid status, well, about 40% of those patients are back uh, in a short period of time, again, in congestive heart failure. So we've got some, um, some things we look at uh, traditionally to determine who's in congestive heart failure. We have some physical signs like a patojugular reflux to look at right atrial pressure, and whether you have an S3 to help determine what your left ventricular end diastolic pressure is, some uh, things like daily weights or looking at BMPs, and uh, None of these things are very good at predicting who's going to uh, have a rise in their fluid status, who's going to have an elevation in their pulmonary capillary wave pressure, go into pulmonary edema, and be hospitalized. The sensitivities and specificities just aren't very good. That's probably one of the reasons that congestive heart failure is the number one. ERG for hospitalized patients. Following uh, weights is not very sensitive, and we'll look at 
something here in a few slides to maybe explain why watching people's waves is not very sensitive at catching people who are going to be hospitalized for congestive heart failure. There's been some trials done that show that weight monitoring, uh, even through scales that communicate with physicians and stuff, just probably not very effective. Another study kind of pointing out the same thing, monitoring patients with weights and clinically, it's maybe not as effective as we'd like to think it is. There's even been studies done where we've used impedance monitoring uh, to try to determine how much fluid someone has in their body. You know, if you change the amount of fluid to lean tissue that you have, the impedance of electrical flow changes through your body. And uh, there's uh, some pacemaking devices that can do this. And, actually give out an audible alert to warn you that, hey, you're having a problem. And what was discovered there was, hey, the patient hears the audible alert and probably go to the hospital and get hospitalized. And so it actually increased hospitalization. Uh, a lot of other, again, non-hemodynamic-based measurements that uh, have been done remotely to try to whether people end up in the hospital and uh, not very impressive results from all those trials. And why do we think that is? Well, when uh, we go into congestive heart failure, there's a whole cycle of processes that are going on. Our cardiac output drops, our atrial pressures go up, you can go into left heart failure, raise your pulmonary pressures, then go into right heart failure uh, because of that, and you've activated a bunch of neurohormonal mechanisms, and uh, by the time you go through all this, then you start gaining weight, so you're really kind of kind of late in the uh, picture, and in fact, you probably sometimes go into pulmonary edema and really don't change your weight much at all, you just change your vascular resistance, redistribute fluid from your circulation into your pulmonary tissue, and now you're in pulmonary edema. So it may explain why sometimes we see people who swear they did not change their diet, did not change their fluid intake, and kind of notice, yeah, their weight didn't change either. But last week they were okay in the doctor's office. This week they're in the hospital on pulmonary edema. Maybe because they just redistributed their fluid into the pulmonary tissue. So this is kind of a graph of what you think happens when people are developing congestive heart failure and what we can detect. And much like the ischemic cascade for coronary artery disease where you develop ischemia, the first thing you have is wall motion abnormality, then EKG changes, and then finally you get angina. This is somewhat similar where what we see is your left ventricular end diastolic filling pressure start going up and then your autonomic system gets involved and then your weight changes right before you're sick enough to go in the hospital. So what we'd really like to do is intervene when someone's filling pressures are changing very early in this process and not wait until they've gained weight and they're just about at the point where they're gonna go into pulmonary edema and be admitted to the hospital. So there are devices that have been developed that <coughs> can perform this feat of changing mechanical energy into electrical energy and they've been miniaturized so there's a whole engineering field of micro electromechanical systems and they can be do 
used to do things like measure the air pressure in your tires, you know, and send it to your <coughs> console on your car so you know when you have a flat. Uh, and there's been some interest in, well, can they be used in medicine? Can we have a system that measures pressure and sends a signal out? You know? And I think there's there were some thoughts in the past about, you know, maybe you can plant one of these devices in a person's aorta and measure their blood pressure all the time. Well, I don't know if that's really all that practical, but you can certainly uh, plant <coughs> one of these devices in someone's pulmonary artery and measure uh, their, their pulmonary artery pressures. So this is uh, done by implanting a device kind of low and posterior in the pulmonary vascular system, and then the electrical signal that can be generated by the device can be detected by an external reading device, and then that information sent through the uh, system, through the internet, to uh, a physician and a team of uh, physician and nurses and determine if a patient's developing a problem. So this is the kind of micro device that's been developed and basically the impedance of the device changes as you put pressure on it and you can calibrate it to a system, external system. And one of the really neat things about the system is it doesn't require a battery because you can input energy into the device and it sends the energy back and it gives you a signal. So this little thing is kind of almost practically, you know, lasts forever and kind of indestructible, I think. So there's been a, the, the major study that was done, the big study that was done to look at this device initially it's called the Champion Study, and basically they randomized patients to receive this device and have monitoring through the de device for the control group where you don't get monitoring through your device, and patients are placed on medical therapy guideline, uh, determined medical therapy for their heart failure, and so treatment group and control group, and the primary endpoint was hospitalizations for heart failure. And they looked at some other endpoints, like what the pressures actually were, uh, and the quality of living scores, things like that. And then later in the study, they transitioned some of the patients who had been in the control group to have active therapy with the device. So the, uh, the trial showed that the, there was a reduction in the risk of being hospitalized for heart failure if you were in a treatment group, if you had your pulmonary artery pressure monitored on a, uh, basically it's on a daily basis. And all the safety endpoints were met. Uh, the, none of the sensors failed. Uh, People were uh, compliant with the, uh, for the most part, compliant with the program, you know, and had their pulmonary artery pressure monitored. So, this is a slide that talks a little bit about the uh, change in pulmonary artery pressure over time. And you see, the treatment group had a reduction in their pulmonary artery pressures as a group over time. They, uh, that's the uh, area of the curve for their pulmonary artery pressures changed. And control group actually went up. There was a significant change between the two groups. So this shows that not only did they reduce hospitalizations, but there was also an effect on the pulmonary artery pressures by monitoring them. And this is another slide that kind of shows the same thing graphically where the control groups, pulmonary artery pressures pretty much stayed at the control level of the patients who were at the device. Information related to their physicians, their pulmonary artery pressures went down. And in the second part of the trial where the control group was then 
have their their data transmitted, their pulmonary pressures went down too. Not much change before the information was available to the physicians, but a, a big change afterwards, and also corresponded with a decrease in hospitalization rates. They looked at some uh, subgroups of people. So this are patients with heart failure related to a reduced ejection fraction and the, uh, the survival improved for those patients who were actively treated. They looked at the subgroups of people who had optimal guideline treated medical therapy versus those partially on that treatment and the device still seemed to make a difference. Again, another uh, example of where supplying the data to the physicians, um, if you were in the control group, your pulmonary artery pressures were higher. Looked at uh, the Medicare eligible patients only, and they uh, had a significant reduction in their hospitalization rates. The question of whether if you already have a CRT device, is this beneficial? You know, so if you have a biventricular device, do you need uh, this kind of monitoring? Would it be beneficial? Well, it looks like, uh, yes, even in patients who already had CRT therapy, um, this additional information is beneficial in preventing uh, hospitalizations and improving survival. And this gives you an idea of how actively treated the patients were. You can see that um, all the medication changes on the far left of the slide all medication changes, about twice as many medication changes if the physicians had the data available on what the pulmonary artery pressures were. And a lot of that change in the next column came from changing diuretic therapy. So that's kind of directly related to how congested you are, what your volume status is. A lot of the other changes maybe not so related Although the third column, the vasodilator, probably has a lot to do with what your pulmonary artery pressures are. And here's the kind of changes that were made depending on the uh, response in pulmonary artery pressure. So a lot of the changes were increases in diuretics, um, but some of them were actually decreases in diuretic therapy. So some patients had their diuretics adjusted down based on their numbers, which is fine, interesting, you know. We've probably got a fair number of people who are out there who were probably too volume depleted and then congestive heart failure. Think about the guy who can't stand up out of the chair without passing out. And then this slide looks through a bunch of, uh, you know, what if you've got these comorbidities like COP, renal failure, advanced kidney disease, atrial fibrillation, do you benefit from this technology? And it looks like all of these subgroups likewise showed some benefit in reduction in their heart failure hospitalization. Slide about uh, patients with uh, <coughs> cardiac resynchronization therapy whether they benefited from uh, monitoring. Patients with chronic kidney disease, again, about a 42% reduction in their hospitalization rates. Patients with pulmonary hypertension, another group, that you might question whether monitoring these patients is beneficial since they've got a baseline pulmonary artery pressure, but it looks like it, it is also. And patients with COPD, so 
a very interesting group because you know patients don't show up in the emergency room and say I've got congestive heart failure. They show up and say I'm short the route. But probably some ability to classify those patients as hey we need to adjust your treatment for congestive heart failure versus hey we need to adjust your therapy for your COPD. Uh, this device. Devices like this have been available for a few years now, and uh, it's been looked at in some, you know, real patient experiences in clinical practice, and it looks like uh, there's a fairly small number of patients that need to be treated to show benefits when you compare it to our other therapies. So, you know, the trials that have been done in ACE inhibitors and aldosterone inhibitors, you know, you're looking at 15 patients or so to benefit, you need to treat 15 patients or so to benefit a patient. In PA pressure monitoring, it looks like if you treat four patients with this technology, you're gonna show a benefit. So, a pretty powerful therapy. So, several uh, hospitals that have used devices like this, uh, showing reductions in hospitalizations, uh, improvement in quality of living scores, things like that, lack of complications from the device use. And this is the reduction in heart failure hospitalizations uh, in a post-approval study. So this is the patient who received the device since the uh, approval of the, the system. And uh, talk about the uh, short-term results here. Six months, you see the uh, control group their uh, pulmonary artery pressure stayed pretty much the same. Again, in the uh, treatment group, pulmonary artery pressure is falling. And it's a sustained change uh, over the first six months and actually continues to improve during that time. Most patients were very compliant with their therapy, transmitting a pressure on average once every 1.2 days. This has also been used in patients that have preserved ejection fractions and had lower pulmonary pressures in that patient group. And this shows that patients who have high, intermediate, or low pulmonary pressures. Um, they can all have their pulmonary pressures affected by this guided treatment. So when you combine uh, a lot of these post-approval uh, studies and look at the reduction in hospitalizations, it continues on even in the real world experience. And Again, looks like it is economically beneficial to the health system to reduce these hospitalizations and has significant improvement in quality of life. So this system, uh, there's one that's been approved by the uh, FDA for the measurement remotely of pulmonary repressors. Uh, it appears that the use of the system, even when patients are already receiving guideline, guideline uh, determined medical therapy improves outcomes. This device uh, has been added to some guidelines and uh, it appears that the post-approval use of the device is showing the same benefits as the clinical trials.
the device is indicated for patients who have class three congestive heart failure. Uh, that is probably the spot in the disease progression where people benefit the most. They're ill enough to have a high risk of being hospitalized. Uh, so that's class three patients are the patients who have symptoms with minimal activities. Class one and two patients maybe aren't quite sick enough to show a huge benefit from this device because they're not at high risk to be hospitalized. Class four patients maybe don't benefit as much because they are kind of at the end stage of the disease and it's hard to affect their rates of hospitalization and their outcomes. So it's approved for class three patients and also, the patients who've been hospitalized for class three heart failure in the last year, so we're trying to prevent rehospitalization. Uh, I think they're probably, uh, you know, working on some other devices. Maybe I've kind of been into home automation, so I've got a bunch of key things in my house, you know, like locks the door automatically or turns the lights on when I come home. I thought maybe this would be good for the next project, you know. So, so this is a, this is actually a cardio meme. Right? How about a cardio now? <laughs> Gotta keep our memes and our memes straight. <laughs> The question was if there's any being done in the metro area. Yeah, and I think uh, there's some some health systems that have implanted something yes. else. We may see. What are contracts to indications for So uh, we, we need someone who can have a right heart catheterization because that's required to implant the device so you have to have access, have to uh, be able to perform a right heart catheterization. We give a little bit of contrast when the device is put in to determine where it's going and if the arteries if the pulmonary section is big enough. Uh, so, you know, an allergy to contrast would be a contraindication or would be a relative contraindication. Um, Class, you know, we want class three for different particular patients. So, and I, I think you'd say, you know, someone who has a life expectancy that's very short would be a Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, so there's an external device that actually kind of looks like a pillow, and the patients lay down on it, and the pillow generates a signal and sends it into the patient, and then a signal returns to the device and tells the reading for pulmonary artery pressure, and then that can go through a system similar to what the uh, pacemaker companies have that they monitor people's pacemakers with. Um, and it gets transmitted to the physician's office and it can be monitored. So you can, you can look at it uh, daily, continuously, you can look at it, you can set alarms uh, for patients. Uh, so I think probably what happens in most clinics is either a uh, technician or a nurse, you know, pacemaker uh, clinic maybe looks at the data or a set of heart failure nurses look at the data every day and then uh, you know, contact the physicians if there's patients who are outside their parameters. Uh, I think there's also
also a app that can go on a device. So you know, if you want to carry around your phone or your iPad, put your patient's phone there, and you can. <laughs> oh, sure. In that container before they start to get worse, before they come to possible drives, how far are you pushing that back? How many days or do you have this? About a week. Yeah. These people that have pulmonary air pressure go up several days before they know that something's up. 